Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to This Week in FCPA, episode 129 for the week ending, November 16th, 2018, the Farewell to Stan Lee edition. First, a word from our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors. Founded in 2004, Affiliated Monitors provides professional, independent integrity monitoring and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across almost all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitors is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on matters ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in over 700 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more information on how an independent monitor can help improve your company's ethics and compliance program, visit our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors, at www.affiliatedmonitors.com. This week, we have a wide variety of compliance and ethics stories, Goldman Sachs and 1MDB. We ask if ISO 37001 can be fixed. MoneyGram continues to have trouble with his DPA. Tesla names a new board chair. Will she have any effect? Has your company assessed the impact of Brexit? If not, the SEC says you better do so. Why 2019 may be a challenging year for internal audit. Are companies meeting their human rights requirements? What is the business impact of bribery and corruption in Venezuela? Chuck DeRoss says that cutting backs on compliance programs would be both short-sighted and foolish. And how does GDPR impacted M&A deals? It's a wide-ranging discussion. And, of course, we will have our own tributes to Stan Lee. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist. This Week in FCPA is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. Back again for another episode of This Week in FCPA, episode 129 for the week ending November 16th, 2018, the Farewell to Stan Lee edition. As always, I'm joined by Mr. Monitors, Jay Rosen. Jay, welcome. Good morning, Tom. Happy weekend to you. So, Jay, uh, in honor of global warming, I have to report to you that we not only had a freeze in Houston this week, we briefly had snow. So uh, one of the earliest snowfalls ever in the great city of Houston. And unfortunately, I was in uh, New York when it happened, so I didn't actually get to see it. I heard they had some snow back east. You didn't get any New York uh, gray snow slushing in the street? I was able to get out before that happened. So Got it. Uh, Jay, we've got a pretty busy week of uh, ethics, compliance, corruption, and a whole lot more. So you want to jump into it? Why don't you tell us about your favorite scandal of the past couple of years, Goldman Sachs and the 1MDB scandal? So uh, this this is certainly the case. It's uh, giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving during this holiday season. Uh I would just say when the editorial board of the Financial Times in London gives you a spanking, it is a very public spanking. And that's what the FT board did on Wednesday with an editorial entitled Golden, Goldman must stiffen its response to bad conduct. And it went out at, at a really interesting way, Jay, that we don't we don't often think through or talk about, which was that this past week, or rather, a couple of weeks ago, Goldman announced the new partners for the year. And one of the previous partners had been Timothy Leisner, the Goldman uh, partner, as I indicated, who has pled guilty to FCPA violations around the 1MDB scandal. But the FT pointed out that there were no compliance professionals in this partnership group. And I thought that was interesting. Uh, and even only one came from the risk department. So um, um, it's really showing how Goldman, uh, I'm sorry, I should say one came from the risk department and one came from the compliance department. So really with a handful of exceptions, the promotion all went to fee earning bankers and traders. So what sort of message does that send when uh, one out of 69 comes from compliance? Uh, Second was an article in the Financial Times by David Crow entitled Key Questions for Goldman Sachs about Malaysian Scandals, where he he posed four questions he thought the DOJ would ask, which is, uh, 
What well, was this the work simply of a rogue banker? Has Goldman fully cooperated with the prosecutors? Who at the company know? And what has Goldman done to fix the problems? I also looked at this scandal in, in the context of the FCPA corporate enforcement policy to see what discounts, if any, Goldman might uh, be eligible for and whether a monitor was warranted in this case. Mike Volkoff took a look at this case through uh, the question of respondee at superior and asking was a partner's actions is it attributable to the corporation if he admitted he lied to the corporation about what he was doing? Um, and then finally, Richard Bestrong uh, uh, used the Tim Leisner guilty plea to talk about his own guilty plea hearing from his FCPA uh, criminal action in the uh, Gunsting case. So uh, a lot to cover, a lot from Goldman, a lot around 1MDB. Uh, and obviously, we're going to be talking about this one for some time. And I guess the other thing that's come out in the last couple of weeks is that it looks like um, Lloyd Blankfein actually had a couple meetings on this. So it's uh, really starting to, uh, I think, implicate this as more of a larger problem at Goldman, that it's not just some rogue folks in the uh, Asian office. But if you have the CEO of the company meeting with uh, officials from 1MDB, or rather 1MDB, that uh, could be problematic. Absolutely. So, so Joe, um, uh, Joe Murphy had an interesting article in the FCPA blog about ISO 37001. Uh, what did you think? Well, um, he does he does not have a, a lack of ideas on how to make the standard better. Um, basically, Joe, who has uh, who is known for his moves on the dance floor has come up with 44 different ways to improve the ISO 37001 standard. Uh, these are a few of the ones that stuck out to me, and I'd be interested to hear if any of them um, resonate with you, Tom. Uh, number six, he talks about deeper reviews. Make clear that in reviews there must be transaction testing, field reviews, and interviews with employees selected by the reviewer. Um, reviewer selection number nine, reviewers should be selected by ISO or another neutral party, but not being, not coming from the company being reviewed. In terms of SECOs, provide specifically that the compliance function must be led by a top manager, e.g. I, I, e uh, ethics, uh, chief ethics compliance officer. Um, Program evaluations provide more detail and examples on how to evaluate. And uh, no surprise here, number 35, monitoring, add to Annex 8.19, specific examples of how monitoring can be done and how it differs from auditing. So, um, you know, one of the knocks on uh, ISO 37001 is that you can really – um, just go and check the boxes and get this certification. And although some large companies like Walmart and Microsoft have done so, many in the compliance community feel that the uh, standard is not worth the paper that it's written on. Tom, any of uh, Joe's suggestions jump out to you? So uh, one was that you need to have uh, reviewer independence. Uh, suggestion 40 that says that the person reviewing the compliance program should not have been the person who put it in place or originally was involved in it. Seemed to be to be a pretty straightforward uh, conflict of interest statement uh, that if uh, when there's future dr drafting of the uh, modifications and standards, there should be representatives from both enforcement agencies and from the real world, not simply those whose only connection is familiarity with ISO standards and the ISO certification process. And finally, probably my favorite, um, if uh, ISO cannot do these things, then hand this project over to an organization that, quote, knows the bribery area and can be flexible enough to develop a more effective system, end quote. All right. So next up, uh, MoneyGram is back in the news. I think we touched upon it last week. Uh, they are our latest favorite recidivist. So um, what does John Rush have to say in his Dipping Through the Geometries blog? So if you're not reading this or you're not getting this blog uh, on, on your feed, you should, because it's one of the most clear-headed uh, 
uh, blogs around in the legal uh, realm. Uh, no polemics, uh, uh, just really reports the law and how it applies to a wide variety of issues, one of which is anti-corruption, the FCPA, other money laundering, uh, antitrust, human rights, human trafficking. It's really a, a great entry into the blogosphere, but this one focuses on MoneyGram, and uh, you're correct there, our new favorite uh, recidivist, because here we had a DPA from 2012 where the company agreed to forfeit $100 million dollars um, in ill-gotten gain and admit to criminally aiding and abetting wire fraud and failing to maintain an effective money laundering program. And here we have a $125 million fine. So, and it's for breach of the 2012 DPA. So when you have a recidivist fine that's higher than the original fine, this is uh, something that is, uh, I can only say in a technical legal phrase, Jay, not good. And um, MoneyGram agreed to extend uh, the DPA. Uh, this means there's been a complete total and other failure of MoneyGram to uh, Im implement the requirements of the uh, Deferred Prosecution Agreement. Um, so um, this is one of the things that can happen if you don't fully um, uh, comply with your Deferred Prosecution Agreement. And uh, MoneyGram tried to state, or didn't try to state, they did state that they've taken significant steps to improve their compliance program and remediated many of the issues from the prior agreements. And still, uh, uh, you know, they had to pay a fine higher than they did originally. So uh, it shows also really what can happen if, if you don't follow uh, the requirements of your DPA. These are real requirements, and the Department of Justice does not look kindly upon those who continue to violate the law and or do not follow the requirements of the DPA and then ask for forgiveness later. All right. So another um, This Week in FCPA favorite, Tesla has named a new board chair in settlement with SEC regulators. And the electric car and solar panel companies board on Thursday named Australian telecommunications executive Robin Denham as chairman effective immediately. Uh, Denham will step down as chief financial officer and strategy head at Telstra, Australia's largest telecom company. After a six-month notice period, she'll work full-time at Tesla, where she's served on the board since 2014. Now, some might question whether or not she has enough independence to do the job, because if she's been on the Tesla board for the last four years, she may have tacitly contoned uh, some of the outrageous 420 activities of Elon Musk. But um, she believes in this company. She believes in the mission and looks forward to helping Elon and the Tesla team achieve sustainable profitability and drive long-term shareholder values. Uh, there was a, a dissenting opinion from um, Charles Elson, who is the director of corporate government senator at the University of Delaware, and he pithily replied, do you ask the person who helped you get lost in the woods to help drive you out? So um, we'll see how that remains. Uh, this would be probably something good for you to cover on a future call with our good friend, uh, Amy Barnum Bard. Indeed. So, Jay, have you assessed the impact of Bre Brexit on Mr. Monitors or, more importantly, the twins? Uh, we uh, do have exposure on Nutella and we are looking for a domestic substitute. But besides that, I think the twins are in pretty good shape. OK, well, that's good, Jay, because uh, there are companies who may not have done the same robust assessment as the uh, parents of the uh, world famous M&M twins, because uh, Jay Clayton, chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, has specifically raised this issue. And I guess the thing that struck me the most, Jay, is we have the U uh, head of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission saying not the head of a British uh, commission or British government, but we have the head of the American Securities and Exchange Commission saying you need to assess the impact of Brexit on your company. And he's saying that primarily to American companies, but really anyone in the American market. And he said, quote, my personal view is that the potential impact of Brexit has been understated 
at uh, last week's, or I guess this week's uh, Financial Reporting Issues Conference. Uh, so uh, if you have not looked at Brexit, if not publicly reported this as a risk, and you're an FCP reporting company or FCPA, um, uh, excuse me, SEC reporting company or a company under the jurisdiction of the SEC, I would suggest you do so. It's still unclear what Brexit will mean, whether there will be a settlement. Uh, we know Theresa May has a, a draft in place, but that and that draft has been approved by her cabinet, but it hasn't been approved by the British Parliament. So we may have a settlement. We may have a hard Brexit. We may have a, a variety of things. And uh, the Nutella issue, I think now that um, you know, now that the M and M girls have identified this. As a potential issue, I think Jay, uh, you know, you may have to take some inquiries from uh, from other companies that uh, have similar exposure. So, if you're a U.S. publicly traded company, you need to assess the impact of Brexit on your organization. So uh, we'll let you double up now, Tom. Uh, the next story comes to us from our good friend uh, Maurice Gilbert, Corporate Compliance Insight. It's always uh, chock full of good information. And uh, you've got an article here about why 2019 may be a challenging year for internal audit. Yeah, it's a uh, article by um, uh, Raphael Go and Leslie McKnight, and I found it really interesting because, um, in addition to a, a gentleman named Malcolm Murray, so they looked at uh, 11 risk and uh, connected by four key risk themes. And came up with five things that internal audit uh, themes, rather, uh, that could be a challenge for the year. Number one was the strategic importance of data. That's data governance, data privacy, and ethics and in integrity. Second is really uh, beyond simply data protection. It's IT vulnerabilities. This includes cybersecurity preparedness and cloud computing. Next was the growth and cost of pressures pressures on and from third parties, pressures around digital business transformation and strategic workforce planning. Theme four was shortened planning horizons. And I think that's probably a theme that we have not talked enough about simply because of the, uh, you know, not 24 hour news cycle, but probably 60 second news cycle now, but uh, extend that to where uh, these authors looked at, which is regulatory uncertainty. Certainly operational resilience and trades and tariffs are going to be big changes. And then number five is how is internal audit going to take all of these risks and incorporate those into an audit that can be meaningfully used going forward? So it was a really interesting article. I would commend it uh, to everyone uh, to take a look at it and to think about it. It's insights really from the uh, uh, anti-corruption compliance perspective as well. And, you know, I think this dovetails on just the the subject of data that we tend to talk more and more about, about how to use data, AI, and how to proactively use these tools to uh, better do compliance and, you know, manage your risk. Uh, next up, we have something from Sam Rubenfeld over at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this is filed under risk. Companies fail to meet human rights benchmarks, study says. Major companies in the resource extraction, agricultural, and clothing industries are failing to demonstrate respect for human rights, according to a study based on the principles from the United Nations. This study was produced by Corporate Human Rights Benchmark a UK-based organization that draws expertise from think tanks, investors, and businesses, and they track how companies perform across 100 indicators. Uh, less than uh, le two-thirds of the companies scored less than 30% overall, the study found, with the average company over at 27%. And uh, Margaret Wackenfeld, Independent Director of Corporate Human Rights Benchmark, said, while we see clear progress from some companies, unfortunately, the majority are failing to make the grade. Of the 101 companies surveyed, 40% of them failed to show any evidence of identifying or mitigating human rights issues. But on a bright note, the study did identify some scoring, high-scoring companies, noting that Adidas AG, Rio Tinto, BHP Billiton, Unilever Group, Valet SA, and others scored above 60%. So uh, in terms of corporate responsibility, we would expect for companies to be getting higher numbers, but I guess it shows um, how high or not high this is on their uh, 
list of uh, priorities. Next up, Tom, uh, one of my favorite uh, extractive companies is Chevron, and you've got an article about them in Venezuela. What's happening there? So uh, as we've talked about many times on this podcast, Jay, Petavesa is the story that uh, keeps on giving as well. And uh, this was a really interesting article in the New York Times, which was um, much broader than simply, uh, excuse me, in the uh, uh, Wall Street Journal uh, by Kale Vias and Bradley Olson. And it's much broader than simply bribery and corruption. But I put it in here, Jay, because it uh, shows – the effects and the nefarious effects and how bad a, having a, a culture of corruption can literally work to destroy a company. Uh, when I was practicing in the energy space in-house, Petavesa, while perhaps not thought of as the top energy company in the world, was certainly well-respected. And I, I met with colleagues from Petavesa legal department at conferences and other locations, uh, uh, very intelligent, very uh, sharp uh, lawyers, uh, very had a lot of pride in their company, and we're looking forward to being on the international stage as a huge player. And uh, Venezuela has destroyed Petavesa. Uh, Petavesa has destroyed itself because it allowed bribery and corruption. Uh, and it really, the article talked about all of the fallout for the country around uh, Petavesa. In the context of Chevron, the last major U.S. player doing business there, considering pulling out. And if uh, Chevron pulls out, uh, I would say it would be a disaster for Venezuela. But frankly, I'm not sure things can be uh, much worse than they already are now. It'll just compound it or exponentially uh, make it worse. But if you want to see the uh, what happens not only directly from uh, the nefarious actions of bribery and corruption, but creating a culture of corruption – uh, literally starting with the top government, top officials in the company, and all the way down, I would commend this article to you. So next up, um, I, I have to give a language warning that I will be using a technical FCPA ter term. So if you have any youngsters in the room, please uh, move them away from the computer. Um, current and former FCPA enforcers were pushing back last week against the notion that foreign bribery cases are on the decline, arguing that annual and quarterly statistics tracking the number of settlements are meaningless. Uh, the experts that we know well are uh, Chuck DeRoss, who's now a partner with Morrison and Forster, and Kara Brockmeyer, a partner with Deba Voice and Plimpton. And we know them both from their associations and time at the DOJ and the SEC. Um, Basically, uh, they sa said uh, FCPA enforcement remains active and will be for the foreseeable future, despite a drop off from the record number of foreign bribery settlements in 2016. Uh, the former DOJ official said a response would be such a response would be short-sighted and foolish because, first of all, the numbers haven't drastically changed. They've remained consistent. DeRoss was referring, referring to the FCPA settlement statistics in 2017 and 2018. Here's where the technical term comes in. DeRoss also had a few pointed words to say about law firm client alerts that look at FCPA enforcement numbers on a quarterly or annually, annual basis. And he said, quote, that's mostly bullshit. And that's... Uh, the kind of uh, straight shooting analysis you get from Chuck. Um, Kara also said that um, basically enforcement statistics can be a little bit misleading when you're seeing it at any given year is the result of what agencies already have been doing for the past two to three, two to five years. So it's talking about the pipeline there. And she also pointed to a new trend that shows the foreign bribery enforcement against companies will only continue. And Brockmeyer said that there's an increasing number of countries that have either adopted or will adopt their own versions of the deferred prosecution agreement. These companies, which we've talked about as of late, are rather countries are the UK, France, Singapore, Canada, and Australia. So the other refrain is if even the numbers seem to be going down domestically on a global basis, uh, there is increased uh, enforcement, and a lot of the countries that are doing this now have either had uh, joint agreements with the DOJ 
But uh, the bottom line is you can't judge the number of FCPA resolutions year to year because you're dealing with a very small number to begin with. So uh, I like that article, and I think that kind of confirms what we were saying uh, a couple of years ago at the start at the Trump administration that uh, the fear that um, FCPA and anti-corruption enforcement uh, would be going down, and that is uh, at least statistically – Not the case. Uh, Tom, data protection concerns and M&A. Yeah, Jay, I thought this was a really interesting article by uh, Nina Trentman in the Risk and Compliance Journal over at the Wall Street Journal, the online uh, service. And she said that uh, GDPR law is turning into a stumbling block for M&A activity involving companies in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Some 539 uh, merger, excuse me, m and professionals were interviewed or rather surveyed by Merrill, uh, and they found that um, there was a wide variety of companies that had uh, uh, were pulling out or not engaging in m and deals because of the companies they were looking at either did not have robust data protection and data privacy compliance programs, or they um, uh, didn't uh, feel like they uh, had a handle on GDPR as enacted back in May. So uh, it really um, showed that you have to have a a robust GDPR compliance program in place and that if you don't, uh, there's going to be sanctions both from the regulators but also the marketplace. And it speaks uh, to another challenge of anti-corruption compliance professionals, which is the same in the marketplace. If you want M&A investment, if our candidacy, if you want private equity investment, if you want a bank loan, you're going to have to have a compliance program in place and one that can be audited by someone who's interested in investing money in your company or taking you on as a merger partner. So uh, data protection concerns continue or are upending M&A plans, and they will probably continue to do so uh, in the future as well. So uh, one of the last things I wanted to highlight is uh, this week, Tom put together a great podcast series with my affiliated monitor co- monitors colleagues, Vindy Siani and Eric Feldman. And the uh, subject matter for this series was looking at how monitors impact culture, compliance, and monitoring for non-U.S. countries in countries outside the U.S. So, uh, Tom, it was a great five-part series uh, any highlights that you'd like to point out to our listeners? So um, this really focused on international, Jay, but not U.S. companies doing business outside of the United States, non-U.S. companies. And uh, it was interesting to hear both Vin and Eric's perspective of not only where companies were, but also where compliance professionals are. Some countries uh, and, of course, there's a wide variety. So in Brazil, it's a little bit further along down the spectrum in terms of compliance programs. In some countries, though, compliance is, is really how do we comply with the law compliance. And so there's a wide variety. It's a wide spectrum. If you're going to enter this space, you need to have the flexibility and probably not only uh, bench strength, but also know how to deal with a wide variety of of where companies are in that spectrum of compliance. So really interesting series focusing on non-U.S. companies. So a uh, little travel this week. I, I heard you beat the weather out of uh, the East Coast. What, what were you doing in New York City and who were you doing it with? So I was putting on a master class training with Jonathan Marks and Baker Tilly, put on a uh, uh, keynote speech for the uh, Ascent Compliance Supply Chain Conference in Chicago. Uh, managed to get out of both and uh, back home in uh, cold but sunny Houston, Texas. So, Jay, um, we both noted the passing of uh, someone who I think has had a huge impact on American and worldwide culture over the past 50 years. And that, of course, was uh, Stan Lee, who, if not the founder of Marvel Comics, was the person that took them to um, prominence. I um, was a big Stan Lee fan from the 60s, and so this week I had a couple of uh, blog posts where I talked about my favorite characters, the Fantastic Four, but before we get to my part or my favorite characters, you want to give us some of your uh, either reminiscences or thoughts about Stan Lee? Sure. So I have to uh, 
give you a slightly different perspective because when I was reading comics, it was in the uh, mid seventies. So I would say it really was not at its um, apex and uh, much to my chagrin, it may not be cool, but I was more of a, a justice league DC comic kind of guy. And I think that was just due to the fact that those were the uh, comic books that my cousins had at their house but uh, I would say that, you know, ever since I was in the uh, entertainment industry in the um, late 80s, early 90s, uh, Hollywood is trying to crack the code on how you bring stands in the Marvel Universe um, to the big screen. And they've had uh, nothing but success for the past decade or so, uh, leading to the company to be acquired by Disney and uh now uh, that Marvel business is one of their best standalone um, investments. But uh, in terms of my favorite characters, uh, I, I just love the fact how Marvel's been able to resurrect careers. So, you know, Robert Downey Jr. was down and out when he became Iron Man. Um, you know, Thor is funny. He's self-deprecating. I would say that M and M are big fans of Guardians of the Galaxy, and while they love Groot and Rocket, uh, my favorite uh, character is Drax. And then uh, one that is really off the beaten path is Deadpool, and I just love how that is uh, such an offbeat, uh, breaking the fourth wall type of thing. So uh, I think my uh, my re- recollections of Stan Lee are more to do with the current film series, but not based as much on the. Uh, comic books as you your reminiscences are from the 60s well he certainly had a huge impact on hollywood and an impact on the world culturally culturally through the movies they've been a fabulous series uh for lots of different reasons but i wanted to uh, i'm also a dc guy and i have to admit uh, i was a dc guy batman superman justice league of america flash green hornet green lantern uh, aquaman uh, you name them but uh, my favorite cartoon, excuse me, comic book group is and was the Fantastic Four. I absolutely love the Fantastic Four and uh, Mr. Fantastic Reed Richards, Sue Storm, the Invisible Girl, Ben Grimm, a thing. But my absolute most favorite of all time was Johnny Storm, the Human Torch. And he had what I thought was the greatest line ever that, that uh, I don't get to use as much as I did when I was a kid, but it's still great to say it. Flame on. So um, <laughs> flame on, Jay. Um, so with that, uh, you want to take us home this week? Sure. So on behalf of Tom Fox, the compliance evangelist, and myself, Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitor, we'd like to thank you for joining us for this week in FCPA Episode 129, which is the Farewell to Stanley edition. We'd like to thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll wish you an early uh, happy Thanksgiving if you happen to get out of town uh, next week. Uh, I, know, I know Tom is taking a trip, so if we, uh, if we don't catch you next week, we'll catch you on the weekend back. So take care. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of This Week in FCPA. Please be advised that on the week of Thanksgiving, Jay and I will not be posting a podcast, so we will miss you um, next week. But we wanted to both uh, wish you a very happy Thanksgiving and safe happy Thanksgiving for you and your family. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist. This Week in FCPA is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.